media. Now, earlier this evening, Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves announced that she's entering her Maggie Thatcher era as she promises to go hard on the economy if elected. And that's looking like a strong possibility at the moment, despite Rishi Sunak's best efforts. But can you really trust Labour to deliver a strong and stable economy? Well, I wouldn't be able to give you a yes on that one. But to give her a take on this very question, I'm now joined down the line by former government advisor, uh, Claire Pearsall. Claire, very good evening to you. Welcome to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Um, I'm not so sure about Rachel Reeves. Um, she talks a good game. She manages to make an entire speech about economic policy without mentioning any actual economic policy. Um, and is Labour really so confident about getting into power that they can even mention the name Margaret Thatcher? Well, it does seem as if they're uh, looking at the Conservatives uh, for all of their economic policies uh, going forward. When you think about what it is Rachel Reeves has actually put forward, it is no different to Rishi Sunak when he was Chancellor, um, investments that Margaret Thatcher wanted to make, you know, encouraging businesses to invest, the private sector working alongside government, improving tech skills, which was a big one from Rishi Sunak, and uh, cementing Britain's uh, position as an innovative economy. So all I think she's done is take the really interesting and good parts of what the Conservatives have done over the decades and added a few words, but no specifics to what Labour would actually do different and why it would work differently. Yes. And it seems to me that, you know, with all of these comparisons going on about whether this is like 1979 or whether it's like 1997, you know, Thatcher was able to unleash the power of the sort of financial services industry, which previously didn't exist. She was able to offer, you know, people the ability to buy their own council homes. She was able to offer people shares uh, in, in companies that were publicly owned and all of that. Blair, by contrast, was able to kind of completely change and revolutionise the way we all lived. He brought the digital age to Britain and all of that. You know, I don't see any of those kinds of opportunities for Keir Starmer to suddenly change the way we live. No, and of course, we mustn't forget that one of Labour's big policies was, of course, this green revolution. Mm. Whether you agree with it or not, I they don't. wanted to put <laughs> 20, I, I didn't think you did. And I'm with you on this. £28.5 billion was meant to go into the green economy. Well, yeah. what was that coming from? And now they've had to U-turn on it. So their fiscal policy has basically fallen apart over just one pledge. Mm. So I think it's down to about £4.7 billion now. So I think we're starting to see these things eke away. And, of course, there was the great uh, non-DOM tax status, right. which Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor, has uh, removed away already. So yes. that also leaves a massive hole of 2.7 billion in uh, Labour spending fees. Yeah, and the other problem they're going to have is the immense amount of money that currently this government's spending uh, on illegal mi migrants coming into to the country. Billions and billions of pounds. It seems to double about every sort of three to six months. I mean, God knows what it's going to be like by the time we get to the end of 2024. Uh, yeah, well, quite interesting. I think it, it will indefinitely increase. Uh, there are no plans realistically from Labour as to what they would do with migration or what they want their policies to look like. And if they do come up with a policy, it hasn't been costed. So I think that we would all be so much worse off, especially if they start looking to open up the borders even further to uh, Palestinians fleeing conflict. Uh, you know, they seem to want to let the world in and have someone else pay for it, which is always the problem you have with the Labour government. Yes. And of course, I was saying this earlier to the panel that, you know, it's been such a long time since they've been in government. If they do win uh, a big uh, majority, which I'm not entirely certain that they will do. Um, by the way, Harry Cole has apparently tweeted out tonight that he thinks the election is going to be on October the 17th. Uh, we'll see about that. But I wonder whether they've actually got the, uh, the cojones or, or the kind of stamina to set up a government because they'll be so thrilled to be in there. They'll be so amazed that they've got a majority. There'll be so many factions of the party fighting with each other for who gets what and how much money can the Treasury give for all their pet projects. I think it'll be chaos. Well, it will. And that, that's always the difficult lesson that opposition parties have to learn. When you get into government, you have to make some real and hard choices. So all of the things that you've promised throughout your election campaign, you suddenly have to be responsible for. Mm. And as we've seen from Keir Starmer, he's not very keen on making an actual decision and sticking to it. And when you're running the country, you have to. You have to sometimes be unpopular. You have problems within your own party that you've got to battle. And then you'll have a very, very noisy opposition who are looking to, to pick holes in anything that you come forward with. Right.
And, I mean, you've been a government advisor. You've been behind the, the curtain, if you like. I mean, what is it going to be like in there at the moment? Because we see uh, Rishi Sunak kind of stumbling from day to day. I mean, I started my show yesterday in which I, I actually said, you know, Rishi Sunak survives another day because it feels like every day is another miracle. You know, it must be pretty down, uh, down sort of trodden in, inside of Downing Street and inside of any government department where you've got special advisors trying to cheer everybody up. Yeah, I mean, it will be really difficult. Most departments are going to be under enormous pressure. Um, I've been out of a government department for a, for a little bit of time, but I work in Westminster. I was there today and the mood just feels really flat, Yeah, uh, especially conservative MPs who are wandering around thinking, why isn't this getting any better? This is just incredibly hard work and wanting to concentrate on winning their own seat. But every single time they want to go out and talk to their constituents, there seems to be another problem yeah. coming straight at them. So it is incredibly miserable at the moment. I should imagine that in departments, there is enormous standoffs between civil servants and special advisors and ministers because we don't know how long this parliament is going to go on for. So there really isn't going to be massive decisions made on spending. No, exactly right. And I mean, that is the thing, isn't it? In terms of the way that the, the future is, is going to be for the Tory party. A lot of people are saying to me, well, let's see what happens uh, at the local elections in May. If it's really bad for Rishi Sunak, that's when the proper plotting will really begin. But Madeleine Grant said to me from The Telegraph yesterday, um, you know, where is the low point? Because every time you think you've reached it, it gets even lower. <laughs> Yeah, and, and that's been the problem. Just when you think you've heard the most crazy idea or the most crazy conspiracy going around, uh, out comes another one. Mm. And we've seen it over the weekend, and it just seems to be this endless round of uh, decisions that are put out, communications that fall flat, leaving a vacuum for everybody to fill. So once you, you don't have a sort of proper comment coming out from number 10, a really concrete decision on what's going to happen and what they actually mean then it just gets into a real mess. And all you see are plotters sitting there working out how best they can position themselves, how best they can leak things to newspapers to make things even more difficult mm. when they need to actually be coming together and working as a team because the real enemy is the opposition and that's who we have to be. Yes, exactly right. And still, talking of that front bench of the Labour Party, I still think there's an awful lot of people in this country who couldn't name you more than about three people sitting there. They could probably tell you who Keir Starmer is. They probably know who Angela Rayner is. They might even know David Lammy, but that's about it, isn't it? Yes, it is. Um, I think they'll probably recognise a few faces. They may not be able to put names to them, but it, that will change. It is a bit natural when you've got mm. uh, you've had an opposition there for for fourteen years that's chopped and changed and hasn't said anything very interesting. The only reason that uh, opposition benches come to your attention is normally when there's been a problem or a little local difficulty yes. being brought up in the newspaper. So I don't think that's unusual. They will have to set out their stall come the election campaign, which is what all MPs do anyway. Absolutely, Claire. Good to talk to you. Thanks very much indeed. I'm sure there's much more fun to be had uh, over the course of the next few weeks. And if Harry Cole's right, and it is October the 17th, uh, you better start strapping yourselves in uh, because it's going to be a very bumpy ride, I'll tell you that.